Well, good afternoon on a Wednesday afternoon uh, here from London and dialing in from Coventry, our special guest and long, long time friend, uh, Dr. Con Keating. And Con is here to talk with us about fair, sufficient and sustainable collective defined contribution pensions, CDCs, as we'll be referring to them. Now, you know me, I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the directors of Zien, and it really is a privilege to be able to introduce so many of these webinars, uh, which is only possible thanks to the generosity, sponsorship, and tolerance of a wide number of people. Uh, and I say tolerant in the sense that they allow us to range widely and freely across technology, economics, and finance. And for that, we thank them. Uh, now, today's subject is one which Khan has published quite a few articles over many years and quite a few reports, and several of them have been published by Long Finance. And we're absolutely delighted to present this thinking of Khan and his various uh, colleagues and team members, because as we all know, uh, ultimately, we would like the one financial product we get to the very end to be pensions. And yet, sadly, pensions, particularly in the United Kingdom, but uh, around the world, have been problematic. They have been, as Khan and I were saying in the green room ahead of time, far too exciting. Pensions should be boring. Pensions should be dull. Uh, and Khan and his colleagues have come up with many sensible suggestions, some of which have been adopted uh, in the area of collective defined contribution pensions, of which more in a moment. Anyway, my job is to get out of the way as quickly as possible so you hear from our expert. Uh, Khan will be speaking for approximately 20 minutes, and there's plenty of time for questions and answers, but there are plenty of people out in the audience, uh, and I know many of you are experts on the subject as well. So what I'd like to do is uh, ask you to please do get your questions, comments in early. Uh, so three points. One, yes, there is a recording of this, and it will be up in approximately two working days, i.e. Uh, late Friday afternoon, I expect. Uh, two, uh, all of the papers, uh, presentations, references will be on the website, and the slides are, I believe, already posted and in the download area already. Uh, but lastly, and most importantly, please do use the GoToWebinar question and answer facility to send questions through to me, which I will feed into the 20-minute conversation with Khan at the end. Uh, I am here with you, so I am not on Zoom, I am not on Signal, WhatsApp, I'm not taking emails, so please do use the Q&A facility. And all of the questions, uh, comments, and observations that you make uh, will be sent on to Khan as well. Uh, with your email attached so that you can get back to you, uh, particularly if there's an area of detail or something that you would personally like to follow up with Khan. Well, I think that's enough housekeeping. I think that's enough introduction. Uh, Khan, the floor is very much yours. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. Um, can we bring up the slides? Yes, right. Well, there's the first slide. Um, let me just begin by saying um, most of what I'm going to be talking about today is work done jointly with Professor Ian Clacker. Uh, although we've also had contributions from Anna Tilber and a number of other people, Mark Freeman and um, Alain Duboisset on uh, pensions accounting. Um, the, I will offer one immediate um, word of caution, I suppose, is the expression. It's quite likely that in the course of the next 45 minutes, I will be interrupted by an ice cream van stopping outside my window and broadcasting at about 140 decibels. Um, you know, don't mistake that for my own stereo. It is actually just the local ice cream service. Um, so let's go immediately to the next slide, please, and get straight into this. Uh, a question, Michael. Indeed, here we go. Folks, we have a poll. Um, the poll question is, are you a fan of collective defined contribution pensions? Yes, no, I'm sure. Don't know what they are. The poll is being launched now. Uh, Khan, you, you and I are not allowed to vote, but you'll find that the audience, uh, FS Club uh, community, vote very rapidly. And in fact, uh, as uh, we hit the 10 second mark, over 50% have voted, over 60% have voted. I'll just wait a few more seconds before closing that down. We're well up into the 80% mark, and we're just going to close that poll now and present the results. And what you can see is uh, fairly clearly 60%, um, 57% technically, are a fan. Uh, a few people who aren't would be interested for you to put in questions or comments as to why you're not a fan. 14% uh, unsure, and 20% are here to figure out what we're all talking about. So with that, the floor is back to you, Khan. That's, that's good. Uh... 
certainly we can do something about the 18 percent or so who are unsure what they are uh, basically a cdc a cdc scheme is an income in retirement it's a pension um individual dc is not a pension individual dc is simply a tax advantage savings scheme because it has no decumulation or pension arrangements attached to it um, that also means that it really lacks any decumulation or um, any risk pooling or risk sharing uh, arrangements uh, unless they happen to be in whatever is bought with the pension pot at retirement um, defined benefit by contrast is a pension it's an income in retirement the problem with db is quite simple it has sponsor guarantees and those guarantees are costly so much so that we have seen db provision drop dramatically we're down at perhaps 15 percent or so of what we used to see um, cdc is a collective pension arrangement and offers pensions as aspirations as what we would like to achieve if we can um, the the critical thing about this is that they are collective and the whole point is unlike individual dc collective arrangements have been known to be superior collective cooperative arrangements have been known to be superior to individual in most areas for at least the last ten thousand years now you can go back to the days of forager communities um, and see that collective arrangements were widely used now the thing about cdc schemes is the benefits are not guaranteed the the extent to which the aspirations can be met uh, arise simply from the scheme's own resources that is to say it's collected it's accrued contributions it's total contributions received and the investment income on those contributions um, it's relatively new that we can actually introduce such things and so far the public the pension schemes act 2021 permitted single and connected employer um, offerings of cdc um, multi-employer and much more should follow and david fairs yesterday was talking about conversations which are ongoing with uh, master trusts and similar things about doing that so the objective with most of these schemes then is to design them in such a way that we minimize the frequency and magnitude of cuts to pensions in payment let's try to minimize the costs uh, minimize the surprise level and the costs of these schemes to pension to members pensions michael can we have the next slide all right the these are collective bodies so there's obviously pooling of longevity risk um this is very well known from the life insurance area the only thing i want to say here that may possibly be considered new is that while you may get to statistically reliable uh, estimates of the longevity of a pool of members with numbers as small, small as around seven eight hundred um, as you get to very much larger memberships I mean, three four five thousand then so you can begin to offer greater flexibility in the forms of the drawdown of pensions um, you can have pensions which are uh, linked in various ways to um, the pot of money which has been put together and the number of lives in the scheme the the key element to cdc is that it effectively pulls the investment horizon um, it's a question of overlapping generations. The scheme's life is greater than the life of any individual. What this means is that the scheme has an inherent greater risk tolerance and will produce a higher total investment income than would single individual DC arrangements 
the, the extent and importance of that can't be underestimated. We've had estimates which range from around 30% to as much as 70 or 80%. It's really very simple to uh, explain why those different estimates of investment income um, arise. And it's basically because if you think about a pension scheme as being half accumulation and half decumulation, which is roughly true, um, in individual DC, it's necessary to de-risk the scheme in retirement in order to assure one's pension income or the stability of one's pension income. In de-risking the portfolio as an individual, you are of necessity accepting much lower investment returns. Now, in the in the on this limit case where you were moved to um, holding cash rather than holding investments in retirement, which of course would give you certainty over your pension um, amounts in each of the years of retirement. Um, the that would be a case where if the if the accumulation and decumulation phases were similar in duration would be a case where you would actually see a hundred percent more investment income from the collective arrangement relative to an individual dc so that that explains why the different um, studies and uh, simulations um, have arrived at numbers which range from 30 to 70 to 80. Now, I haven't seen any which actually go to that limit case of holding everything in cash. Then there are two further elements which don't get talked about in the literature really at all. And I'm going to talk about both of them quite extensively today. Uh, one is risk sharing. And this comes about in the mutual insurance, which is actually implicit in a DB type allocation of the notional notional allocation that is of the pensions contribution there's also the possibility with cdc to operate risk sharing among members that is to say between non-pensioner members and pensioners in a way which helps to smooth transient market volatility effects let's go to the next slide please michael Just to touch on sustainability, what's the key to sustainability? And the answer is quite simply, it's fairness. It's equity among members. The, that leads to some fairly simple rules. Uh, for example, cuts, when they are applied, should be applied to all. They should be applied not only to pensions in payment, but also to the interests of the non-pensioner members. Um, cuts should be either immediate, that is to say applying to the current pension payment only, or absolute, that is to say for all future. The regulations allow intermediate levels of cuts, cuts which apply for three, four, five, six, seven years. I'm very nervous about those as they open the door to the possibility of intergenerational unfairness creeping in um, through, the, through the cessation of a sequence of cuts. Um, the, they are allowed by the regulation, and I think that's, uh, that has the possibility of some unfortunate and un, undesired um, consequences. Um, another simple rule is that there should be no use, no use of new contributions to subsidise prior deficits or to distribute surplus. Now, I'm going to make a lot of this question of surplus because the, one of the great attractions to CDC is that the aspiration can be exceeded and pensions in excess of those which were aspired to could be delivered. And there are some further rules which I will discuss as to how one should go about determining 
whether such surplus distribution should be made. The key, the key to sustainability it lies in distinguishing the, between the transient um, from trend. In other words, volatility, which is all um, fear and greed, versus trend returns in markets. I mean, if you want to think of it in engineering terms, it's actually distinguishing between signal and noise. And the, the object is to avoid cuts or surplus distributions, which arise from noise rather than from signal. I'm also going to talk a little bit about a contractual accrual rate, um, which is the discount rate, which we would use for the valuation of um, liabilities. Next slide, please, Michael. Now, let's explain what we mean by contractual accrual rate. Um, there's a simple toy town example here of a 15 year deferred annuity. Five payments 10 years from now of 100, a current premium on this of 180. The internal rate of return which links those payments, i.e. the rate of return which will deliver those payments is 8.23. The numbers themselves don't actually matter, they are just what they are. Um, that then results in a liability trajectory, the expected development of that deferred annuity, as we see there, the red line. Next slide, please, Michael. That's all that the CDC, that's all that the contractual accrual rate is. It's just the IRR, which is the rate of return retire, required on a particular contribution to achieve the benefits projected. So let's take that simple deferred annuity again and introduce the idea that we could today buy an asset using um, which returns 10%. The, if we discount those five payments at that rate, we arrive at a present value of 146 pounds versus the 180 premium which was charged. That, now there's a real problem with making um, the obvious leap of faith there, which is that that difference between 180 and 146 is profit. It is profit, yes, perhaps, but it's profit not yet earned. The, that value, the 30 odd, 33.85 it actually is, um, is an embedded value. So what we have to think about is um, how do we then go on to consider um, distributing or looking at deficits or surpluses? And one of the problems that's likely to occur if we are not careful is that that discounted present value, the difference in the first diagram between the green and the red line, could be used to subsidize earlier payments um, of pensions. The bottom diagram there shows a sequence of um, 100 pound payments in each of the 15 years. So you can think of it as being a, a pension which is paying 100 in each of the next 15 years. And the discount rates are the same again. And we see the um, recognized liability you calculated using the car and the asset value against those um, needed. The, the green line is the discounted present value using 10% expected rate of return on assets. Under the proposed new scheme regulations, an annual viability test is going to be imposed on CDC schemes. Of necessity, that viability statement will use as its discount rate the expected return on assets. That's going then to produce 
uh, a liability flow like the green line in the diagram below. The problem is that that is not necessarily correct. Um, if one were to distribute all of the difference uh, day one, um, then one would find that the, the subsequent requirement was that any variation from the 10% um, expected return on assets would require immediate correction of the, the benefits paid in that year. And that, of course, is exactly what we don't want to achieve. So the question becomes, what should, what can be safely paid? And let's have the next slide, please, Michael. And now here we are showing in the top right hand diagram, the evolution of embedded value. The blue line, the blue line in that diagram is the embedded value evolution of the simple 15 year deferred annuity that we showed earlier. You can you see that the embedded value declines as time passes. And then we have also shown on there the accumulated um, profit earned, that is to say, recognized to date. And the bars below show the amounts which can be recognized safely in each and every year. The, the point is that these can be distributed as profits or as bonuses at that time. And subsequent, this does not, this does, if we pay the amount shown here, we do not impose a requirement to earn the expected rate of return in the future on this. These amounts can be paid and have in and of themselves no consequence for the ongoing scheme, the, the circumstances in which deficits might occur and cuts be necessary are the same before and after the distributions made there. I've shown the, the same diagram of evolution of um, realized profits and evolution of the um, embedded value for the 15 year equal payment in each year. And I make the point that that area where the large red and blue arrow is, is the area which is dangerous. That's the area where one could overly distribute bonuses using a viability based valuation, uh, unlike um, using the contractual accrual rate and looking at the, the amounts actually earned. The yellow bars beneath are the amounts which can be safely recognized in each year. Next slide, please, Michael. Um, Decumulation. Um, one of the things we've been looking at, um, I won't dwell on this in any great length, is that the membership of the scheme is going to be heterogeneous, varying in wealth, cognitive capabilities, health, longevity and so on. So flexibility in retirement income patterns is desirable. Um, I just show here three different possible um, arrangements for the distribution of pensions in retirement. The, we could have a separate discussion in questions uh, about the desirable and best shape of distributions in retirement. Uh, particularly as um, there's some um, uncertainty as to consumption or expenditure patterns of older ages and so on. And there's interesting work going on on that. And the point about these different um, consumption patterns in retirement is that they carry with them consequences for the total investment income available um, to the scheme. Um, the yellow line, which is um, 
an inflation linked pension payment is um, the one of those which is maximal in terms of total investment income. And obviously the one where you front end much of your cash, um, well, it has the limit of taking everything as, as cash on day one, in which case your future investment income is zero. Michael, next slide. The, so contributions are the next point that I want to deal with. 15% um, of salary, and um, we'll allocate this DB style. Um, the, now, with CDC, if you have a 15% contribution, then 15% of salary goes into both young and old members' pots. Here in these diagrams, I have a 24-year-old and a 64-year-old um, accruing just one year's um, benefits. The, the point in, to be made here is that we can answer the question which many people seem to believe, which is that the investment return earned by the younger member makes the, the pension being offered which would be typically perhaps one, one and a half, an 80th, a 60th or whatever of final salary um, or a 40th of career average, um, less fair for the young than the old. The key about, the key to understand this is that the younger member has a higher pension or longer in almost all circumstances. Longevity is increasing. The 40 years between the difference between the young and the old member in this illustration. Um, there's also inflation and the wage inflation and price inflation applying to the younger member's pension. This means that investment returns, if investment returns are low, um, then the subsidy comes not from the young to the old, but from the old to the young. The, the turning point at which we see the level of subsidy or the direction of subsidy change is determined by the rate of longevity increase, the difference in that between the 64-year-old and the 24-year-old, and the rate of inflation in wages and the rate of inflation in prices in retirement. And that is quite interesting. Um, it's also particularly interesting now where when we look going forward at um, what are we likely to see in the future, well, given where we are post pandemic with the levels of government debt that we have, austerity and financial repression are clearly going to be on the cards for some very sustained periods of time, which means that the younger members should in fact want precisely the DB type of arrangement as it serves to limit their exposure to the low rates, which are like the low real rates, which are likely to prevail. Um, the, there's a diagram uh, there which shows um, what happens if we allocate CDC sky, style um, in, a, in an environment of low um, achieved interest rates. And the answer is um, that the old, will be off to the races. Um, they will have far more cash than they need. Whereas the young will find that their pensions fall short and are not uh, met. The next slide, Michael. Yeah. Khan, while I'm just putting that up, uh, we've got a, quite a few questions. So if we could uh, stick to time, that'd help a bit there. Um, I'll just, um, the well, um, 
let's go let's go past this one um this is just showing um, lifestyling um so i just want to bring in some risk sharing rules um this is a way of fair smoothing of the um prices of assets without actually smoothing the prices of assets at all um, it can help to reduce transient volatility and sequencing risk um, and the idea is you distinguish between um, non-pensioner members and pensioners the two rules here if the scheme is in deficit set a time for recovery a time for cure um, and that should be one over deficit in years and these rules will operate on the car-based immediate, what have we got, where are we now, not the viability um, valuation. The second rule is to set a maximum amount of support available, of risk sharing available, and 10% of active deferred member beneficial interest does the job, uh, at least does the job in all the cases I've looked at, other than some very exceptional circumstances. The key is that when a pension is paid in full in deficit, the beneficial actives or deferreds are increased by a similar proportion. That rebalances beneficial interests and maintains fairness. Let's just go to the next slide, Michael. The, and this really is my last slide. Regulations require an annual viability valuation. It's forward looking, as I've already said. If it is in deficit, then cuts to benefits must be made. Those are the regulations. There are, there's considerable flexibility, obviously, although there are extensive disclosure rules as to the elements which make up projected liabilities. Um, that, I think, needs to be complemented by the status quo valuation. Has the scheme progressed? to date in accordance with the promises originally made. That's aspirations rather than hard promises. So what that's actually comparing is, where are we now? How are we doing? The, that valuation compares the assets currently held with the accrued value of projected benefits calculated using the contractual accrual rate. And that's where you would apply risk sharing rules. Uh, in simulation, cuts occur less than a half a percent of the time and are usually very small, less than 5% of the current pension. And that, I think, brings me to the end of my slides, does it not, Michael? It does indeed, and that's really good because we've got quite a few questions out here and comments. Um, I'd like to start with a quick one. It's a, a good survey question from Charles Vermont. What is the benefit of a collective defined contribution scheme compared to a well-diversified SIP? Less effort is the principal advantage. If you're going to talk about a well-diversified SIP, you're going to have to be managing it, and you actually have to have certain levels of cognitive ability. Um, would you, for example, have projected the sort of behavior of asset prices that we have seen in the pandemic? Would you really have seen that all of those shopping malls and all of that commercial property would be so massively massacred in terms of its asset values. Would you ex ante have foreseen much of what else has gone on? The, the advantage to CDC is that you are producing an investment return over your entire lifespan. Now, a well-diversified SIP, you're still going to have to face the question of de-risking in retirement. And with that, you will be accepting lower investment returns, even if diversified. You are going to have to go down to holding more and more bonds, more and more gilts. And that comes with an investment return cost. Mm. You'll also have lived through the vagaries of markets, the value of your SIP overall going up and down with the movements in the markets. 
Khan, um, Andrew Young is curious, in a CDC scheme that you're proposing, is any of the contribution uh, allocated to a member? Is it just a collective pot? Uh, and what is allocated to each member is the target benefit accrual, which is then subject to annual adjustment. So the contribution mm -hmm. determines how much is added to the total pot, question mark? Yep. Uh, okay. Um, got to the end of the question before um, getting there. Um, the the answer is yes. We do allocate to the individual. The individual can see a pot. The allocation style that I would favour would be that of defined benefit. In other words, the allocation made, even though the scheme overall may have say fifteen percent allocation to um, the 15 percent of salaries allocated to the scheme overall that might be as little as six and a half percent um or so allocated to the younger member uh when investment returns are high and um, investment returns being high um and that would also mean that there was um, a higher allocation to the older member, uh, which would be sufficient to pay his pension in full and the other. The, the, the reverse, that is the, that's the question of subsidy between older and younger members. And I've mm -hmm. written extensively on that. Um, you know, that's clarified, I hope, for Andy, the situation. I can certainly send him a lot more illustrations where the level of support is, in fact, the other way around. In yeah. a world of financial repression, you can expect the level of support to be in the opposite direction, i.e., between the younger, between with the older member supporting and subsidizing the younger member. Now, Oh, Aston Brown makes a point that part of the challenge is really uh, you know, basically kind of cashing, uh, you know, cashing out. So at retirement to convert a, a current DC savings to retirement annuity, it's quite expensive. And he's seen costs such as $180 per $1 of monthly income, you know, for a guaranteed 10 year retirement payment uh, to retiree or beneficiary. Um, and that raises a point which I think Ann uh, Sanders uh, has here. If transfers out of the scheme are allowed, how would you go about determining that transfer value? Uh, I'd do it on the basis of the beneficial interest of the member at that point in time. Okay. And the beneficial interest is the member's interest in the overall scheme and the transfer value would by definition be the net asset value of that transfer value. Okay. That is their equitable interest in the scheme. And yeah, well, I have to go over to using the expression beneficial interest because equitable interest has a specific legal meaning, which I wouldn't want to apply. Um, the, the point is, if you are taking funds out at the net asset value of your beneficial interest, then you are taking money away, but you are doing no harm to those who are left behind. The assets that are there are a similar proportion of the benefit of the scheme. Um, before and after the departure of that member or members. Um, two points point about the uh, contractual uh, agreement rate uh, from Brian Woods. Do the trustees choose the CAR and should they be prudent in choosing it? And a second question from Tim Miller related that. It's unclear to Tim whether the CAR is calculated as the IRR of total assets relative to future cash flows or is it purely forward-looking based on the IRR of future contributions relative to the future benefits those contributions are expected to earn? The, the answer is the, the contractual accrual rate is overwhelmingly determined at the award. At that point in time, you have a set of projected benefits for a member you have an expectation on the part of trustees of the range of investment returns which can be achieved um, at that point in time. The, that sets a contribution rate or amount that gives you a contractual accrual rate. 
the contractual accrual rate is the compound average of those across members and over time um, and that is the way in which it's determined um, you can also vary it by changing after um, award the level of expected benefits either because of experience which has occurred um, or because assumptions seem to be um, either overly conservative or overly generous um, but the contractual accrual rate is a consequence of rather than a determinant so, so the point that brian's asking about the trustees role in choosing the car the trustees role is principally limited to setting the contribution the future service terms on new awards there are secondary concerns with ensuring that experience matches and, uh, experience and assumptions um, continue to make sense. Now, Khan, Khan will be getting all the questions and he can reply to you, but Khan, I've got three uh, and I, we are short on time, but I'm wondering if you could just shortly at least just touch on them. Uh, Peter Tompkins, can Khan explain to us where his expected return from assets as a point of calculation comes from? Now, who's expecting it? I, I have a DC plan and I hope for a return of 10% per annum, but I'm not expecting it and I won't take account of that in advance. If I get it, I might get more of my pension, but if I don't, then I won't. But this is yeah. who's who where does the expected return on asset? The trustees. Okay. Good. Uh, the second question is from Derek Scott. Why will CDC be able to use a viability test based on expected returns when defined benefit DB? is soon no longer to have that option and low risk low dependency discount rates based on gills will wind up being applied um the simple answer to that derek is because that's what the regulations say the regulations say that we should be using best estimates everywhere and the viability statement as it's defined in the regulations requires a forward-looking discount rate to be brought uh, to bear um, doesn't actually specify how you determine that, uh, but it is it is a forward-looking rate which has to be used, and it's mm -hmm. not a prudentially biased one. None of the estimates, none of the assumptions with CDC are required to be prudent. There is no building of buffers inherently within a CDC scheme, although you could actually see our risk-sharing rules as providing elements of buffering. And finally, and I think this is the question always on people's minds when they're presented with a kind of too good to be true, uh, and I'm not claiming that this is presenting it that way, but you know, it, it, we're always poking the holes. And uh, you've touched on a few of these points, Khan, but Martin White has asked a question which might allow you to kind of just wrap things up. Khan, how does the scheme adjust and achieve fairness if, over time, the investment returns disappoint? For example, many people are discussing investment returns with past long-term returns as the start point. If we have a much lower growth world in future, which you mentioned, real rates of return, especially after expenses, might be close to zero on risk assets and perhaps even below zero on low risk assets. Do you recognize this as a possibility and what, what, what difference would CDC make? The CDC will still bring you the benefits of collectivism whether the rates of return are high or low. Um, if your comparator is what you can do with um, CDC, uh, with individual DC, well, you know, with real returns of, you know, two or three percent, individual DC's total returns over a lifetime aren't going to be worth having. The, on the other hand, um, collective DC should be positioned to deliver reasonably good returns and those are precisely the returns in which the circumstances in which the returns of the younger members which are most sensitive to the interest rate earned over the lifetime of the investment return earned over the lifetime of the fund um, are um, most sensitive the um can it be done yes it, yes it, it, Simply, yes is the answer. 
Con, I, I really appreciate you getting on. This is, you know, this has been an inherently unfair have we got time for the last presentation. Question? Sorry. Have we got time for the last question, Michael? No, no we, we got we got we got through all of them actually. I mean, um, I'm in the poll. Sorry, the. There's another poll, is there not? Have we convinced oh, everyone? Anyway? Uh, the poll question, yes. Um, let me just uh, get that moving. Um, so, folks, uh, you've listened to all that. Uh, you know, so the second poll is do you believe that CDC pensions will become an important part of private pension provision? Uh, we're just launching that poll. Uh, you've listened to everything. Uh, you can still be unsure, but hopefully, we'll see a, a movement. Con, it's been inherently unfair to ask you to produce a, a 45 minute presentation of a complex area, but it really does help get the message out. Uh, almost all of the audience have now voted. I'm just closing that poll now. Uh, I think it's a very gratifying poll, Con. You've got a 80% with you and 20% uh, either no or unsure and evenly split on that. So- uh, I made no dent in the numbers. <laughs> well done. Uh, it is technical, folks, um, and I hope it's there. We've put into the chat room, and they'll be cross-referenced on the website. All of this is requires detail, but Khan has very confidently and nicely summarized it in a quick 45-minute area and been able to handle some of the initial uh, thoughts and objections. I myself, uh, when first presented with it, did have that too-good-to-be-true feeling. As you'll probably gather, given the support of FS Club and Long Finance, I and the team here are convinced this isn't just something to look at, this is something to get doing. And I'm glad, Con, that you and your colleagues have spent so much time really thinking this through and pushing it uh, in the face of, oh, well, let's just, let's just let things ride as they are. Anyway, our sponsors never let things ride as they are, and so I'm absolutely delighted uh, to have you uh, here today. I'm also delighted that you allow us, as I said earlier, to range so freely. And if pensions aren't one of the crucial aspects of financial services, I have no idea what is, uh, but there is also a technical aspect, uh, and Ian Clacker and uh, Khan did some interesting work on that and how, in fact, uh, CDCs could be delivered perhaps quite effectively over a distributed ledger. Not necessary, but there are certain advantages. Um, so a quick three rounds of thanks, if I may. I thank the sponsors. I'd like to thank you, the audience. It has been technical, and I noticed that uh, everybody um, stuck online, which is very impressive. Uh, not sort of deciding to sign off on the afternoon. Uh, there's more ahead. Uh, tomorrow morning, we'll be looking at sandboxes. Much talked about, well, where's the software for these things? Uh, and then a fascinating presentation next week uh, from Dr. Jeffrey West dialing in from the Santa Fe Institute on all the issues to do with scale, the universal laws of life. It'll be really interesting, uh, and I'm looking forward to it. But my most sincere thanks I have to go to Khan. Khan, it's always a delight to have you on. It's always a delight to work with you. Uh, and I love the way that you challenge all of us, and I hope that you keep doing so for an extraordinarily long time. Uh, unfortunately, I can't open it in technological terms, the floodgates of applause. Uh, this metaverse talk hasn't quite reached that far, but I do have my Korean karmic clapper, and I'm afraid that will have to do uh, as air south's applause. But thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Thank you.